Okay, in this third video for the BTEC uh, game programming, I'm going to show you how to. Let's just run the project we've got. I'm going to show you how to spawn sprites from the tile map. So if we just look at our tile map, we've got our walls, but we've got these blue tiles, uh, these yellow tiles, the green tile. And the red tile actually are just markers, positional markers for uh, various sprites that can do things. Okay, so like player sprites, pickups, enemies, anything that we want. Okay, and we've used a different type of tile for each one so we can identify them. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to show you the process of taking those positions and generating sprites at those locations so let's just stop this running so you need to have done the um tile map video first if you're doing a single screen game that's all you needed to have done um, and then you can follow this on so this is going to be the job of the level because that's where the um, tile maps defined so if we go to the constructor for level and what we want to do um as long as we do it in the constructor before we finish, that's that, that's all we need to uh, trigger this. We we can do it a couple of different ways, but what we're going to do is we're going to get the game engine to do all the hard work. So we're going to at the near the bottom of the constructor. So there's my uh, level viewer, the thing that lets me scroll around. So I'm just going to do it on the line before that. I've put a couple of blank lines in. I'm going to say process graphic mac so if you see on the picker that will come up and then it what it, that's going to do is it's actually going to run through all the tiles and it's going to run some code that we're going to write that I'm, we're calling a tile processor so we just need to give this a name so i'm going to call it generate sprites you can call it whatever you want and I've then i put a semicolon after the bracket so i'll just zoom in a little bit um, that doesn't exist, so we're going to put our cursor on there and do control full stop. And on the picker, we're going to say generate method. So I'll just click that, and you'll see down below, it'll generate that method for us. So if we just go down to that and delete the exception line, we can start putting code in. Now, what will happen <clears throat> as the um, tile map... Um, looks at every single tile in the game it's going to throw the location in the tile map and the tile number it's looking at okay now what we can do is we can use that to generate a screen position and we can then create a sprite at that position okay so the first thing we're going to do is we're going to pick up what the screen position is of the particular tile location that the tile map's been processing so we're just going to say vector 2 pos so we create a vector 2 value call it pos and in that we're going to say pixel location center then we're going to open a parentheses and we're going to put the location value so you can see that what was given to us was a tile number and a location okay so that's the first job that we need to do. Don't worry about that red squiggle. Okay, we'll come on to that in a minute. Right, now, what we're going to be given is a tile number. So if we just quickly look at the level data for the tile map, so that's level1.txt, unless you've changed the name. These are the tile numbers, but we specified them as characters. Okay, so an X was a wall, M was a wall, at was a player dollar was a coin which is the, what, what i'm going to show you uh creating in a sec the other ones are similar but i'll i'll show you i'll show you this okay um so what what we're going to do we're going to be given a number but we want to be able to use the character okay so let's go back to level and generate sprites so what we're going to do is we're going to do a switch which is a decision um statement and what we're going to do is we're inside the little bracket there. One thing you can do when we're doing Visual Studio, let me just delete that. You can, if you type the name of something, if you get a snippet come up, so it's saying like there's a snippet there, and it says tab twice to insert it. So if we do tab, tab, it will put 
some basic structure in for us. Okay, so it's put the parentheses in and it's asking us to type what we want to switch on, what we want to make a decision on. So what we're going to do is we're going to say tile index. Okay, so I'm using the picker to pick that. And then I'm going to put square bracket and I'm going to say tile number, which is this value we're given here. And then we're going to end that with a square bracket. Okay, so what we're saying is, Let's have a look at the, the actual character that we've been given. Now we've got a default here, so it says, oh, if it's not one we're interested in, because we're not interested in all the tiles, we're just interested in our special marker ones, um, we do something. So what we can do there, under default, if we press enter, we can say return tile number. So I'll explain why we're doing that in a second, and the break line we don't actually need, so we can just delete that line. So what we're saying is when you examine a tile number, if it's one that we're not interested in, here, just have the tile number and keep it in the tile map so that we draw a wall or a floor or whatever graphic that we want to draw. But we want to pick up particular cases. Okay, so I'm just above the default line. I'm going to say case, and then I'm going to put a single quote, which is next to the, is the at symbol key, and I'm going to look for the dollar. Okay, then I'm going to put a colon. So this is the structure we have. If we then press return, we can then get this uh, black line. So what we're going to do is we're going to say new, and I'm going to make a coin sprite. Okay, so I'm going to say new coin at pos. So I'm going to generate a coin sprite at this position. Now it's moaning at us still. There's loads of red squiggles. Coin doesn't exist, so we haven't got that yet. But we need to tell the tile map what we want to do with the tile at that position now to be fair we don't actually want the coin graphic tile we had like a yellow block we don't want that there we don't want anything okay because we've replaced it with the sprite so what we're going to do is we're going to say return minus one now what that'll do is that'll blank off that position okay so you'll see this when it runs so i've got a coin sprite that i need to create so this is all you need to do to actually replace those tile map blocks with actual sprites. So let's generate the coin. So let's do control full stop while the cursor's on coin and say generate class in template. So if we look at the top, it should have generated coin. Right, we need to include all the using statements. So we're just gonna copy all the using statements from the top of level, go to coin. Oh, he's already got one in there, but we'll just overwrite that. And we'll put that in. Okay. Right. We need to tell this is a sprite. So if we go to the class line where it says class coin, put a colon and say, right, we're inheriting from sprite. Okay. Now, <clears throat> it's decided to store the value again. We don't need that because we're just using that as a position to place the sprite. So we're going to delete the field that it's created. And instead of this dot pause, we're actually going to put position 2d use the picker equals pod so that sets the position of the sprite just above that we're going to make sure that we add the sprite to the game engine so we're going to say gm engine manager add sprite this remember if you don't do that line nothing will display on screen and you won't be able to manipulate the sprite or anything and then we need to define a frame for it okay so the frames are going to be in our sprite sheet so Again, I'm going over to the graphics. So we did this before for the texture, so I'm just going to do it again. I'm loading up Fireworks, and I'm going to find out, and you'll see that on the sprite sheet, there's some little coin graphics. So I'm just going to put put a graphic on so that I know that the coin's been generated to start with. Okay, so you can see, if I zoom in, let's just select one of these and zoom in a bit. You can see I've got these like little yellow uh, discs and I'm going to show you how to do animation. So these are going to rotate Okay, it's not going to be an amazing effect and you can do better graphics than this But I'm just as a, a test. I'm just going to use this yellow circle So I'm selecting it. So the down at the bottom here where I've got X Y width height I can use that val those values to define the frame for this sprite so 
I know it's 36 by 36 high, but it's the X and Y position I need first. So I need 180X, 252Y. So let's go back to Visual Studio. And in my coin sprite, I'm going to say frame.define, if I can type properly. I'm going to say gm.tx sprite, because that's where that sprite is loaded into, that sheet. Then I'm going to define the rectangle. So the rectangle, my short term memory is gone, I can't remember. So I'll flip back 18252. Remember, you've got two screens, so I'll make use of them. And then I remember the height and width was 36. Put a semicolon at the end. Right, that is the minimum I need to do to create a sprite. So let's just review what we've got. So we defined a sprite. In its constructor, it's given a position. We use that position to set the position of the sprite. Okay, back in level. We created our process graphic map routine, which runs generate sprites for every tile in the tile map. And we're saying, right, if we find a dollar tile, which if we look at our level data, dollar was all over the shop, but specified where we were going to put a coin sprite. If we find a dollar, we want to generate a coin sprite at that position, and we want to blank off the dummy tile that was there, the placeholder. Okay, so if we run this now, we should have where all those dollars were, coin sprites, hopefully, if it's worked. There you go, yellow circles. So not very impressive at the minute. Um, obviously, if you've got a nice coin graphic that you've stolen from Mario or something, then you can use that. So you'll see that they're all in the right positions. The sprites automatically scroll as the um, viewport scrolls. So you don't have to do any extra work. Okay, so let's build the animation for the coin. Right, to do animation, animation is just a sequence of frames. So if you've done any uh, animation with things like uh, flash or anything like that, it's just a series of images that are displayed in turn, okay, as in the simplest form. So what we need to do is just define a sequence of frames. So we've got one frame. So if we go back to fireworks, you can see what I've defined is one, two, three, four, five, six different frames. Okay, in fact, I might define another one. So I'm going to copy that and paste. Oh, no. Just to make a narrower one. So I'm going to change the width of that to three. So I've got all these frames and it'll, it'll make it look like it's rotating. Well, that's the idea anyway. Okay, so all I've got to do is define a series of frames. Now, the only thing that changes is the width. The height's the same. The Y position is the same each time. Because I've lined them up well. Um, so all I've got to change is the X position and the width. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to copy and... Pa oh, let's count how many we've got again. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. So I want seven frames. So I've already got one, so I'm going to copy the whole line. Remember, if you just leave the cursor on that line and do Control C, it will copy the whole line. If you then do Control V, it will paste the whole line. So I want seven in total. So I've got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Okay, so the first one is that full fat coin. So if I just flip back to fireworks, the next one was at 217 and width was 30. So 217 width was 30. Flip back to fireworks. The next one is at 260 and the width is 24. So that's 260 width 24. The next one is at 300 and width 18. So that's 318. The next one is at 340. Oh, what was the width? I'll go back. The width was 12. The next one is at 370. And width 6. And the last one, the very thin one, was width was at X is 380. Obviously, if you've got your own graphics with your own frames for an animation sequence, then obviously you need to use those. And the width of that was 3. Okay, now if we run this again, so I've defined seven frames. By default, there's no animation, and the first frame you define gets shown. So we're not seeing any of that there. We need to actually activate the animation. Okay, so let's go back to coin. 
and it's uh, to do this animation we just want it to change images o over a short period of time so we're going to say frame dot animator dot animate rate so this is like a flash animation and you'll have to play with about with the speed so i'm going to say to start with every 0.1 second so we put 0.1 f i want you to animate and then when we get to the last frame which is that very thin one we say last frame dot action so I just pressed enter there do dot and what i want to do is i want to reverse it so it animates up to the thin one and then we animate it back to the fat one okay so i'm just going to do reverse and when it gets to the start again it'll reverse again so it'll just keep going backwards and forwards that should be all we need to do for the coin for now okay there's no closing text or anything like that but they'll all start animating so let's just do f5 <clears throat> there you go and they're animating it's moderately convincing it'd be nice if you want some more frames um or or even you add something where you change the color okay so let's have a look at maybe changing the color so we make it darker when it's on it looks like it's at the back side so we can do that by saying frame dot animator dot oh, callback what did i call the callback for this sequence end callback okay so if i do that so when we get to the end of a sequence so either the last frame or the first frame we can call a routine so we say plus equals uh what should we call it change color so it doesn't exist so i did control full stop say generate method and it creates it down here for me now what i'm going to do is i'm going to look at the color wash so i'm going to say if wash equals color dot white then what i'm going to do is i'm going to say change the wash to equal to color dot gray so it goes darker else make it white so it must have been gray let's just look at that let's see if, i don't know if that's going to be the right thing let's just see what that does okay so let's just look at the logic there we're saying right when we get to the end of the animation if the color is white for the wash that's just like a color you can apply to any sprite we'll make it gray if that isn't true it must have been gray so we'll make it white so we're just toggling between gray and white let's run that and see what it looks like it might look awful right so what's happening <clears throat> even when it's full it's toggling so we only want to toggle when we're at the end when it's like looks like it's um on its edge i'm doing hand movements here but you obviously can't see that right so what we need to do before we attempt to change the color we need to do another if so i'm just going to put if and i'm just going to ask the frame animator so if we say animate uh, dot uh what is it current something oh active frame it might be active frame so if active frame equals so i'm looking for a particular frame now what you've got to bear in mind is when we've got lists of things we've got seven frames here that we defined but the first frame is frame not so that's not the next one is frame one so i'm just putting some comments in here three or comments a double slash five and then the last frame is six so what i can do is i can say if the active frame is six i.e we're at the thin graphic now i'm going to put a brace now it's put two braces together okay but i want to encase all of this in braces so i'm going to delete that closing brace i'm going to go to the last bit of this line so where it says wash equals color dot white press enter and then i'm going to put the closing brace now if that's worked properly what you'll find is that it's indented that code so we're saying we're only going to do this check for the color if we're at the thin frame okay now we could have said frame dot animator dot 
Uh, did I call? Did I have something called last frame? No, I don't know whether I did. End frame. No, I didn't. All right, let's leave it at six. I thought I'd build some in there, but I hadn't. I probably have, but I can't remember what it's called. But that'll do. We know it's frame six. Okay, so we're only going to try and flick the colour when we get to the thin frame. So let's just see, because that's where it looks like it's flipping. Let's run that this time. I wasn't going to show you colour effects, but I, I might as well. Oh, interesting. It didn't work. Oh, hang on a minute. It might be that the thing's just animated already. Let's just put a break point on there. That's F9, so we can stop the code and see what active frame it's actually set to. I might have already changed it. Right, so if we just move our mouse over active frame, oh, it's already gone back to five. Okay, that's all right. So I just, if I change that to five, because we've already reversed it, I'll just have a look at that actually. So this time we might actually get the effect. There you go. So every time we, we do a reverse, and we're at the end of the animation sequence, we change the color. So it looks like they're spinning around. It probably look a bit better if they're a bit faster. So we can change the speed by changing the animation rate. So let's do it at 05. So that's 20th, every 20th of a second. So I'll run it again. And then you can play with that a little bit. It's it's not mega convincing, but it's quite a cool effect. Obviously, you don't have to do that color wash thing. That was just specifically for that. Okay. Everything's up to how you want everything to be. So you can, there's endless combinations of things that you can do and loads of different ways that you can do it. Obviously, if you've got a graphic that's got all the animation frames, then you don't need to mess about with that color stuff. Okay. So that that's just a static sprite. So that's a sprite that doesn't need to know anything about... Um, things to do with the game tile map it's not going to be colliding with any walls or anything they're just sat there they're just decoration that we can pick up but you will have other sprites so if we look back at our level map we've got the e don't know i put a pound there we've got the e tile that represents enemies now enemies will need to be able to do collision detection with the maze or the um platforms okay so we'll need to do something slightly different when we generate an enemy so let's go back to level and let's go to our generate sprites routine so if you can't find this while you're on level if you just go up here you'll get a list of all the methods you've got and all the fields you've got we haven't got any fields for this but there's the method so you go straight to your generate sprites we're going to put another case in for the e so we're going to say just inside the braces, we're going to say case, single quote, capital E. It's case sensitive, so make sure you use the same symbol. This time, we're going to create a new enemy. So I'm just going to call it enemy. Okay, again, adapt this for how you want your things to work. So we're going to give it its position we want it to spawn, but we're also going to do something else. It'll need a reference to the tile map so that it can do collision detection. So we're going to pass it a reference to this tile map so we use the keyword this and it should go blue okay so we're going to generate that enemy sprite in a second i'm not going to put any code in there other than to show a graphic to show it's been spawned but again because the e character tile was just a place marker i'm going to say return minus one okay if you don't do return minus one, you do have to return something. So the other thing you could return is tile number, and that will leave the block still there. Okay, but let's just create the sprite and get rid of that. Okay, so enemy doesn't exist, so I'm going to move my cursor there, and I'm going to say control full stop, generate me enemy, and you'll see what it does this time. So when it's finished chugging, right, enemy's been created. So if we look up here, or if you've got your cursor over an item if you press f12 it'll go to that item so if we press f12 now jumps to enemy for us so you'll see what it's done so we're going to pass it a position but it's also got a reference to level so it said level and it stored it for us which is quite nice of it so like we did before we don't need the position i'm not interested in that so i'm going to delete that line but i'm going to keep the field called level 
that's now broken this line but I don't want to store position like that I want position to be position 2d okay equals pos now it doesn't know what position 2d is because I haven't put up here on the class line that enemy is a sprite so I need to put the colon and then inherit from sprite again it doesn't know what a sprite is let's see what happens if we do control full stop so if we do control full stop don't just press enter just have a look what it's got it says change sprite to engine 7 dot sprite which we can do but it's got this it's decided that that is using the game engine library so it's going to add that in for us so we can say using oh click the wrong thing there using engine 7 i just clicked that minus there which closes it up by accident so i've added that in so i could just copy from the top of level again all the using statements which in the long run is easier okay so if i do that or i can manually put the ones in a want at the end of the day it doesn't really matter if they're not being included it doesn't waste anything because it doesn't bother linking up to the libraries for that file okay so we've got a basic enemy for all sprites i've shown you already if we say gm.engine.manager.add sprite this that makes sure that the game engine deals with the enemy okay draws it lets it update lets its uh, artificial intelligence logic run etc etc we need to do a frame so i haven't got any frames in my um, fireworks document for this because um, i didn't bother you can see there's a dodgy mario well, jump man set of animation frames that is the only walking animation for jump man from donkey kong so i haven't got any for that so i'm just going to put a placeholder uh, graphic in there so i'm going to use one of the pre-built ones so i'm going to say define frame and i'm just going to say text dot and i've got various things the circles you've seen uh and i'm going to use a target black okay so that's like a i think it's a white t with a white border with a black inset okay so it stands out on other colors quite nice actually so i'm just going to do that for now okay so that should display an enemy where those e's were so if we just run the system and then i'm just about done so i'll do a little recap in a sec and you'll see that i've got these t's let's just scroll along to make sure the other ones have been produced where all the e's were i think i had four in there okay now we've got <clears throat> a black background okay the actual screen color is black because i think that's what the default was in the game setup class um, so wherever we have got minus one tiles so tiles that don't exist and that we're not drawing or having to worry about we actually see the background through okay now you can look at another video that will show you how to create a background tile map which is an image um, to do that but what i'm going to do is i'm going to show you the change the screen color so that you can see that they actually literally where all this black color is there isn't any um tile data at all so i'm just going to kill that and i'm going to go back to game setup and you'll see it if we go to the constructor for game setup which is at the top there you'll see that i've set color dot black so i'm going to change that to a i don't know what color to use uh, i want a a dullish color not too bright um uh, cornflower blue i think that's quite light so i'll use cornflower blue so screen color equals cornflower blue so if i run that again you should see that the blank place on the map are now blue there you go so you can see that the enemy t things carry sit out a little bit now now one thing you will notice is that the t sprite isn't sat on top of the tile okay which is a bit of a problem but it's to do with alignment and centering and things like that so let's just have a look at how we can fix that because you'll be tweaking that with your own sprites anyway okay so i'm going to go back to level and to the generate sprites subroutine method so i'm using that pause but what i want instead i want the bottom of the tile where the little e was so I'm going to do this. I'm going to say inside, I'm going to say vector2 bottom equals 
Right, so I'm going to say pixel location bottom. And then I'm going to give it the location we were given. Okay, <clears throat> now I've made a mistake. It's moaning at me. Let's have a look at the error message. It says can't convert type float to vector2. All right, so I've just made a, a mistake. This should actually be a float because it's a single value. So it's just the Y location at the bottom of the tile. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to change this code. And you'll do this and you'll refactor things and change things. So instead of doing this position, which was the center of the tile, I'm going to say pos.x, bottom. So I still want the center of the tile, but I want the bottom of the tile. Now, enemy's moaning. He's saying, oh, this is, doesn't take three arguments. Okay. Because, yeah, if we look at enemy, it just takes two. It takes a position, which is a vector two, and it takes a level. <clears throat> All right. So I'm going to change that now. So looking at level, I'm passing it a floating point value for the X position, a floating point value for the bottom plus the tile map. So I'm going to go to enemy. And in the constructor, I'm just going to change this and I'm going to say float x, comma, float y. So I'm going to say expect and a floating point value, call, we'll call it x, expect a floating point value, we'll call it y, and the level reference. Again, this is because we're refactoring, we're breaking things, but we're going to fix them. So position 2D is no good to us here. So we're going to delete that line. But what we can do is we can set the x and y values of the sprite directly. So we can say big X equals x. Make sure you use the pick when you're doing that. And then we can say y. And it's the big Y equals y. So we're setting the y position directly. Okay. So I've ch that's that's what we call refactoring, reworking things. So we've got these x and y positions. Let's just run it and see what the effect of that is. Remember, if, if I've gone too fast, just go back in the video and just follow it back through. Now, so it has moved, but this time it's moved into the um, tile. OK, so it's embedded in the tile. Now, you might want that effect for some things um, like a spike or something like that that sticks up out of the tile a little bit. But in this case, I don't really want that. All right. So if we just kill that, look at the enemy by default. All sprites are centered around their X and Y position. OK, but we want this Y position to be the bottom of the sprite. So what we need to do is change the alignment. So we say align equals and then again, use the picker. The align comes up. So press that, then press dot and then we'll get what it does. All these are described. OK, so we've got bottom. So bottom, it says X position is centered, which is what we want. But the Y position is the bottom. So let's just try that and see what the effect of that is. So you can mess about with alignment. You've got center, bottom, top, left, right, top, right, top, left, bottom, left, bottom, right, depending on what you're doing with your sprite. Usually walking sprites, you want to align them to their bottoms. It makes it easier to do animation and things like that. OK, let's run that and see what the effect of that is. Hopefully the T's are at the correct position. Now you can see they're sat on the top of that graphic now. OK, so they're aligned properly for me. So all I've got to do to finish rendering this level with these fantastic graphics I've got is actually to finish the tile map and then put in the sprite for the exit and the sprite for the player. So the blue one, remember, that was I was using that to mark where the player starts in the level. So it's important that we, we do that. OK, so all we'd need to do is look at our level data, which is level one dot text. So an at symbol was the character we used for the player start and the G was for the goal. So all we need to do is go back to here. OK, I'm not going to do that. I'm I'm going to leave that up to you. Put our cases in for the the goal sprite. I would do the same as what I did for the coin. I just want a position. It's not going to interact with anything for the player sprite. I'd probably do the same thing again, 
pick up this bottom. In fact, what I'm going to do is I'm going to move that. So I'm going to refactor. I'm going to move that out. So I'm going to cut that line and I'm going to put it up here so that anybody who wants to use that bottom value can use it. Because I think I'll probably do it for the. So if I do, 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 do it was at, wasn't it? I think. So if I do the player, so I'm going to say new oops, player or whatever you're calling your player. Now, sometimes they will auto correct what you type in. I don't want player index. I want something called player, which I haven't defined. So I just did control Z to undo. So I'm going to do the same thing. I say pos.x bottom this. I'm not going to build this. I'll do that in another video when I show you how to set up animation for walking and things like that. And I'm going to say return minus one. So I'm also going to do the goal. So I'm going to say case. I think it was a G. Let me just double check. So back to the level there. Yeah, it was G. So back on level case G. That's going to be just a goal sprite. Uh, and I'm just going to do pause like I did for the coin because it's just going to sit there ready for me to collide with it. And I'm going to say return minus one. OK, so this won't run now because I've got these errors. OK, but that's the, the process for doing that. And obviously, the more special tiles you've got, the bigger and the more cases you're going to have. OK, so let's just review what we've done for this video. So we wanted to take our special marker tiles from our tile map and generate sprites. So we went into level. And just before the end of the constructor, the one the method called level, we put this code in process graphic map and then we gave it the name of a, a method to run as it processes the map, which we got it to auto generate. We call it generate sprites. So it gives us a tile number and a location. OK, and all we've done is we've picked up some screen position data from the tile location and then we just examine what tile number it is by using this tile index square bracket tile number. And we just respond with a case. We just say, right, we're looking for a goal, which was G, generate a goal sprite. Clear the tile. Remember, the return minus one just means clear the tile. And we do it for the other ones. OK, the ones that need to interact with the tile map. So anything that's going to be involved with colliding with the walls and everything, we have also passed a reference to the level. OK, by using the, this keyword. We have to set a default up to say, what do we want to do if it's a tile we're not interested in messing about with? So we just say, oh, keep your tile number. And that's why we say return tile number for default. And then the only other thing we did was did a little bit of um, sprite work. We did multiple frames to do a little animation. We did a, an end callback to do a little bit of cleverness with the coloring, but we didn't need to do that. If you're not interested in that, just leave that out. Then we created an enemy and we messed about with the alignment. OK, there isn't much else that we needed to do. The next set couple of videos, there are some separate videos that show you do various things like flashing and things like that. But the, the next video I want to do is going to be um, your control character and making them look like they're walking by making the animation happen when you've moved a certain amount of distance across the screen. OK, so I'll end this video here. Really, it's for you to play with. If you've got ideas of what you want to do, that's the key bit. I can tell you what directions, what techniques to use to achieve those effects. OK, so you need to like communicate with me those ideas. OK, I'll stop the video there.